Hello, and welcome to Formula Phil. Hello, chaps and chapesses. It's time for another classic 24-hour Le Mans story. This is a great yarn, so strap in, and let's just belt into it. This story is about the 1953 Le Mans race. The 1953 Le Mans is often hailed as a significant race. For the first time in the event, the victorious car averaged over 100 mile an hour. In fact, the first six finishers all achieved that feat. The average winner's speed was 108 mile an hour. A new distance record was set at 2,555 miles, or 4,088 kilometers, smashing what was thought at the time the impossible 4,000 kilometers barrier. And to put that remarkable feat in perspective, in 1995, the winning distance was 4,055 kilometers. It was also the first time a car had used disc brakes, brand new tech for the time. And a race report of 1953 hailed a thrilling dice between Jaguar and Ferrari that raged throughout the night. This was truly one of the great Le Mans. But all this pales in comparison to the extraordinary story surrounding the number 18 Jaguar C-Type and its drivers that already unfolded before the race had even started. Jaguar were quietly confident. Though they were running smaller engines than their rivals, they had slippery bodywork and these new non-fade disc brakes while Ferrari, among others, stuck to the tried and tested drum brakes. The drivers gave Jaguar further cause to smile. Of the six nominated to drive the three C-types, two were previous Le Mans winners, and one was a young, soon-to-be superstar, Sir Sterling Moss. But it is the number 18 car, with rank outsiders Duncan Hamilton and Tony Rolt, in which this excellent story concerns. Jaguar made a terrible mistake on the Friday practice by running two cars with the number 18 on it, and it was an instant disqualification for Rolf and Hamilton. Disqualified and dejected, they both decided to abandon the team and commiserate alone. All their energies that was put into racing Oman was now channeled into an entirely different direction. They didn't just have a few beers, or even just got conventionally drunk. They smashed it, and they drank literally all night. They were found at 10 a.m. the following morning in a restaurant called Gruber's, now drinking coffee and nursing apocalyptic hangovers. Hamilton, in his brilliant autobiography, Touch Wood, described the scene as thus. We were sitting at a table, feeling ill, miserable and dejected, when a Mark VII Jaguar drew up outside. William Lines got out. He had paid the fine, and we were back in the race. In six hours' time, the flag would fall. Neither one of us had any sleep, and 24 hours of racing lay ahead. We ordered more black coffee and inquired if there was a Turkish bath in the town. There was not. William Lines, of course, was Jaguar's owner. In fact, it was both William paying the fine and team manager Lofty England, whose great skills of persuasion that made the ACO reinstate the car. Lofty now had the task of straightening the drivers up for the 4 p.m. race start. Hot and cold showers, along with vast quantities of black coffee, were ordered. In Hamilton's account, two hours before the race started, he and Rolt were feeling worse than ever, and left with no choice, he decided to order two double brandies for himself and his teammate. The effect was remarkable. Tony Rolt kicked off the driving at 4 p.m., passing the pits after the first lap in seventh place behind the Moss Jaguar and two front-running Ferraris. By the time the afternoon turned to evening, it was number 18 which headed the field, the Moss Jaguar having dropped out of contention with fuel supply problems. Thereafter, there was just one race, that between the lead Jaguar and the Ascari Villoresi Ferrari, the former boasting better brakes than agility and the latter relying entirely on its brute power. The battle raged on into the night, the lead swapping between Ferrari and Jaguar. The C-Type was in a league of its own when slowing from maximum velocity on the straight for the hairpin at Mulsanne, but it was losing time to the Ferrari on acceleration away from the corners. Eventually, however, the balance started to shift in Coventry's favour. By breakfast time, the Ferrari was broken. Hamilton took the victory flag at 4pm, having driven almost his entire share with a broken windscreen and a broken nose, all a legacy of a bird strike on the straight. I bet that sobered him up. Less than 30 miles behind in a strong second place came the Moss Jaguar, having battled its way up through the field in a 22-hour flat-out sprint. 
Jaguar were victorious. Far from being on the point of total collapse, as you might expect from such an effort, Hamilton Rolt partied yet again, once more into the night. Now, what a story. A certainly sign of the time story. In 1953, drink driving laws were in their infancy, and there is conflicting accounts to Hamilton's of what actually happened before the race. Lofty England swore that there was no brandies given to the drivers, and said, I would never let any drivers on the track under the influence, and I had enough trouble with those two sober. Tony Rolt himself said that the brandies before the race were fictitious. Both men said this in later life, when now, and rightfully so, drink driving is vilified, so I'd imagine they are not going to be glorifying driving under the influence. Especially in the 1955 Le Mans, just two years later, there was a disaster that killed 80 spectators. Though alcohol was not a factor, it wouldn't be prudent to be all gun-ho and boys club and drinking and what have you. In fact, after the 1955 Le Mans disaster, the race was changed forever. But that is definitely for another video. But as I said, it was a sign of a times, a different time. And Hamilton swears by his account. And on a side note, Duncan Hamilton was actually Irish. He was born in County Cork. So as far as I know, he is Ireland's only Le Mans winner. Well, so far, anyway. So let's wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed the story. And if you did, please like and subscribe. Please check out my other videos. Uh, have a cracking day. And good luck. Yeah, it's flaming.